Well, thanks everybody. Thank you for um, coming to uh, to the second uh, formal session in today's uh, GCDCS 21 conference. The first part by Eugene Roman was great, as as Eugene always is. Um, and as I am loath to do, I'm I'm going to just differ just just a tad with one of the things that Eugene said. He defined digitalization as digitization at scale. And I've actually written fairly extensively on this topic in, in past lives. And, and I've always positioned digitalization as the second step in a process where digitization is, as, as Eugene himself said, um, automating once manual tasks uh, or assets in some cases. So digitizing assets or digitizing uh, manual tasks uh, into digital equivalents. Digitalization in this continuum uh, uh, construct that I like to use is the next step where you connect digitized tasks into digital processes. And that leads in turn in the construct that I built a, a few years ago to uh, digital transformation, which is connecting digital processes into fluid digital business capabilities that can adapt, you know, as Eugene said, flexibly, rapidly with speed, to uh, both uh, demands and opportunities. Um, I put that construct together and I tested it with uh, some senior executive leader types. Joe, I believe you were one of them um, and got universal pushback on that saying you're missing a step because once you get to digital transformation, you still need the step for the people who actually sign the checks. They are not signing checks to be a digitally transformed infrastructure. They are signing checks to enable innovation. And that really is the root of today's, uh, today's session. Um, digital transformation in pursuit of innovation. And as a result, we're gonna live kind of a parallel life in the same way that we're both physical and virtual. We need to uh, accommodate the fact that we are both talking about the, the foundation, the digitally transformed foundation that allows us to fluidly connect and pivot and react and respond. Um, but also looking at the innovation that those, uh, that those core capabilities enable. So um, with that, I think I'd like to, like to introduce our, our uh, opening uh, speaker here. Um, you know, I just ask the question, is, is Andrew Epic the most popular guy in our, in our virtual room today? Um, you know, he might well be, and, and, you know, it's a pretty popular group. Um, anyway, if, if there is anybody who doesn't know Andrew, either online or, or in person, and, and that seems unlikely, but he's a Canadian who's held senior management positions with Equinix in the U.S., the U.K., and Germany, and is now and has been, um, since a major acquisition a year ago, uh, managing director for Equinix Canada. So with that, I'd like to turn the uh, virtual podium over to Andrew and... Uh, uh, Stacy, maybe we could uh, maybe we could bring up uh, Andrew's slides as well, so if we can get Andrew and his slides. We'll be well up. And in the meantime, let's go ahead and give Andrew a hand, so he knows he's appreciated. I feel the love, Michael. Can you hear me in the room, gang? Yep, we can hear you. Excellent. Hey, thanks for the uh, the gracious introduction. And the only thing I'll add to the resume is uh, I'll celebrate my 25th anniversary as a McMaster graduate. So. Uh, thanks so much for the hosts uh, there in Hamilton. Wish I was there with you. Um, hey, gang, last year around this time, uh, I indulged in a little bit of group therapy because we were one of the companies that made a billion dollar uh, investment. And uh, that doesn't come with a little bit of post-purchase anxiety. So we chatted a little bit at that time about why Equinix would make such a significant investment where a very smart seller on the other side was, was, was exiting the data center space. So a year later and a, a whole lot of road traveled during this pandemic, uh, wanted to give you an update on how things are going and how we're hopefully supporting these digital transformations that Eugene so eloquently talked about. But truly I'm here to tee up a much uh, smarter bunch of, uh, of, of gents to really double click on the, 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 the connection between the digital core, the ecosystems that that interconnects with, and ultimately that digital edge that's really pushing towards those users, again, that Roman talked so much about. So if you don't mind, uh, advance the slide and we'll get going. So uh, hopefully the picture uh, is worth a thousand words, but when we bought Bell Canada, um, we inherited 600 customers, 
a great set of assets, but truly uh, the people were the gems amongst the acquisition. Um, Eugene finished with, with kind of a call to arms for the Canadian uh, kind of next generation to carry and steward this digital evolution forward. Uh, I think we got 160 of, of the best and brightest uh, and, and really aligned culturally with Equinix is all about. Um, and happy to report a year later that 99% of those employees are still with the company and absolutely flourishing uh, within the global framework. But hey, what we did was we, we tried to set about equinizing uh, the environment. Uh, as you can see by the planes here, um, Bell Canada ran these as kind of separate operations and, and didn't necessarily do the integration because ultimately their good business decision was to guide all of that traffic back to their network, their primary uh, uh, set of business. But we've done that heavy lifting. We've integrated and equinized these shops. Uh, and one of the key things uh, that we do is neutralize as well as make these environments more densely uh, populated with a variety of networks. So uh, a year later, TELUS is, is prominently featured in, in, uh, in the East Coast as Rogers is comfortable in the West. Um, finally, when it comes to the, the global platform and the ability to scale, um, we really went about tooling the organization in such a way that we could take advantage of, of the broader global platform that was already in place. Uh, we have the opportunity to do business in, in 27 countries around the world. So the opportunity to kind of coalesce and make sure that we are aligned uh, in Canada really makes sure that this doesn't become kind of a cottagey outpost, but rather a, a, a true extension of the platform where companies in Europe um, that, that, that have GDPR and, and data sets and, and access uh, protocols that are much more like Canada than they are like the U.S. can feel really comfortable kind of uh, popping in Canada and pointing towards the Americas environment. So just a whole bunch of progress with regards to the integration, but really what we feel, and it's to echo Eugene's statements, is we're setting down Canada's digital core. Uh, this is a shift um, that I'm truly very excited about uh, and hope that others get excited about too, because th this is going to be a game change with regards to the acceleration of digital, uh, already four times faster post-COVID uh, than pre. So we've, we've got loads to talk about uh, again in the panel as, as, as we kind of click through these, these intro slides. So if I could get you to advance to the next one. Great. So the second part of the story in a Canadian context is, is basically connecting these buildings. So the idea that these standalone centers with our care and attention and kind of investment of funds to get everything upgraded to our, our, our global specs and ensure those five nines, um, ultimately in isolation really don't do much for the, the enterprises that are trying to go digital and digital first. So the, the, the next step in, in the evolution is, is ultimately to take those buildings and interconnect them uh, with various products, one of them being Equinix Fabric. And I promised Michael that this wouldn't be a pitch, but I just say it in the context of, of the value that that brings to customers. When you have 40% of the cloud on-ramps uh, globally, it gets you a familiarity of what their requirements are so that when Equinix came to this new market, very natural for them to connect with us in Montreal, in Calgary, picked off Winnipeg in between, uh, and future-proofing towards Vancouver, we lay down this fabric that's data sovereign, coast to coast, that allows those hesitations in the Canadian market to basically see the value within the sovereign borders, but then again, join this extension of the global fabric. It really starts to create this amplifying effect where the participants uh, find us in all the right places, intersecting all the right partners that then in turn create all the right possibilities um, that, 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 that we're aspiring to. So I get to, to the next slide, please. The, the, the final chapter in kind of our first year evolution is around extending that digital edge. And we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of that and kind of the monetization of the data at its source. But the digital edge is something that now is an extension of a global platform. So when I saw Eugene's comments on those great um, uh, organizations of past, as well as the aspirations of, 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 I know, a mighty bunch of IT leaders here today in Canada, the ability to be global, um, but then localize it in the same kind of data sovereign and, and, and secure ways really is this uh, step change that, that we then as Equinix provide uh, on a global platform. 
Q3, we had 36% of our business was actually enterprises in Canada that were exporting their digital wares and getting set up in other locations around the world. So I, I'm perhaps slightly more optimistic than the previous speaker. And I think that we're, we're poised and ready. We've got this global platform that's in place that forms the core. We have this ecosystem of partners that are working well and, and kind of coming up with integrated solutions. And then moreover, that expertise is getting exported, uh, at least from the customers that, that, that we're working most closely with. Hey, if you could, Michael, advance to the next slide. I truly want to get ready and tee up these, uh, these speakers. So this information that we've gathered here is actually part of uh, something that we call the GXI, the Global Interconnectivity Index. And what we've learned from hundreds of enterprises that are kind of the leaders of the 10,000 customers that we have globally is, is this kind of bridge, if you will, between the idea that cloud first is about optimizing infrastructure. Um, and, and we've done that in Canada. We've readied with research and measured it and quantified it and put out RFIs followed by RFPs. Uh, but that's really a planning based on current infrastructure and making sure that it's more efficient. And I'd assert based on, uh, uh, I guess again, on behalf of these hundreds of enterprises that are kind of pushing that forward, digital first is about optimizing business. It's basically responding to what that next uh, 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 phase or, or that next thing that's coming that is absolutely unknown. Um, I really love the, the, the term that the DAAA expertise. I think we, we bring that um, in the form of this GXI and, and, and the shared practices. And, and what we're seeing is in a post COVID world, those that were not ready um, uh, had survival issues. Those that did have this kind of nimbleness, this readiness with an architecture that works uh, were absolutely poised to, to, to dominate. So again, four times faster in the last 18 months is the acceleration that we've seen uh, uh, amongst these top enterprises. Hey, interconnection is obviously going up. Another point to kind of drain off this slide, uh, nine times more than the internet traffic in the public domain is this more bespoke one-to-one -one and one-to-many that's in environments that are interconnected on what we'll call the, 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 the private internet that sits within our buildings. And it's forecasted to get 15 times larger. So this, this capacity, this robustness of networks is, is not going away. Uh, the, the final point is the fact that industries, and we'll get to hear from uh, a, a gent from Amped that's in the film and media, but you can go across all the different industries, whether it's finance, uh, manufacturing, retail, et cetera, uh, there's basically evolutionary changes that are happening in these industries where when you used to be able to chase with hardware and kind of follow uh, Moore's law down the rabbit hole of uh, a little bit smaller, a lot faster, a lot less price, uh, you fundamentally aren't going to get there with the network architectures of, of 10 years ago. And, and unfortunately, if you only throw more hardware and more network capacity at that same architecture, you're almost kind of piling up the sunk costs and creating more rigid architectures that you feel that you, that you just you can't walk away from something that you just revamped and retooled. So I, I would say the two main reasons that, that this becomes paramount rather than a, a, a choice or a decision, data is increasing exponentially. Uh, again, Eugene talks about a billion transactions in a second and a half. Um, think about that multiplied in the 27 countries that we do business uh, in around the world and the 10,000 customers. Uh, data is going off the chart. We just can't seem to get light to travel any faster. So that proximity and location becomes kind of paramount to these future architectures uh, on how they set up and push that digital edge towards where that data can become useful and monetized. So, uh, hey, if you're, if you're kind of taking a breath, uh, like I'll get a chance to do in a couple of uh, uh, secs here, um, you're not alone. Uh, we've surveyed that there's about 48% of the C-level execs uh, admit that they don't quite know where to start. Um, and, and that could be a, a bit of a daunting and kind of a, a scary place. Uh, and what we would assert if you advance to the next and final slide is that basically the network we think is foundational. Uh, we don't sell networking gear. We're not in that business, but we have for the last 20 years been that safe haven, that place where the internet intersects globally. So this idea of understanding on behalf of our customers, how that networking equipment is architected and how those workloads are distributed 
uh, has been, a, a, I think, to this point, an enviable spot of kind of the, the, the no owner of any particular horse, but, but actually enjoying owning the track and, and kind of seeing these solutions develop. So again, I think it, it would start with a, building a digital core um, and, and the, the, the difference between on-prem and these data center conferences that, that I've enjoyed for the last half dozen years, we're always edging kind of the, the conversation towards hybrid. I think we've, we've fully arrived, but I would suggest that cloud and cloud adjacency becomes kind of the new on-prem. Um, so that's what we mean when we talk about the digital core, and that's absolutely required in order to create these digital services. Once you have the digital core, um, it's a team sport. Digital transformation cannot happen in isolation. Um, uh, I just suggest you, 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 you don't have to be religious about this, and I don't care which side on vax or no vax or Bitcoin or no Bitcoin. There's no such thing as a single threaded digital service that doesn't have multiple participants as well as multiple partners required to kind of prop it up. So I would suggest that digital participation is enabled by this interconnection of these ecosystems uh, of which we uh, thankfully boast about 10,000 participants globally uh, on our platform. Hey, and finally, when it comes to this digital edge, and you're gonna hear this term probably repeated more and more by vendors and, 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 and uh, advisors alike, it'll be kind of come the new cloud word, but the digital edge is the most often used and sometimes least clearly defined. I think the, the, the plain reason for that is that the, the user or the consumer or the creator of that data really gets to decide what that digital edge and where that is. Um, for retailers, it might be that affluent um, shopper on aisle five that's making that decision between buy or no buy and online versus offline. For a mining company, Digital Edge could be down in a, a mine where really getting clear on that data is the difference between million dollar decisions of kind of pointing the, uh, the, the drill in one direction or another to hit that lucky pocket. And I mean, if it, if it can be made even more crystallized and more real, think about the federal government. I mean, my goodness, to get that many employees uh, online and activated in home offices when quintessentially public sector is about kind of going to the place and doing the work at your desk where you got the picture of your kids. And I mean, like that, with this, 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 this post-COVID, this PC, uh, great term again, Eugene, world, um, that's really what we need to be and standing ready with. So uh, far right of the slide, and, and I promise my last comments, if you think about a digital core that's available again, both hybrid and on-prem, off-prem, you then expand that with the digital participation, with the ecosystems that you're able to join, and then your final ring at the edge of what other your consumers of the data define. Um, then therein, I think, is this next major shift. Um, I'm not uh, is, is, is um, uh, much of a veteran as Eugene is. I hope that one day, maybe with a few decades more, I'll have my own winery under my belt. But he, he speaks the truth. And it's, it's fun to hear these step change opportunities that are in front of us, because I truly feel that in Canada, we've got an exporting capacity. You go all the way back to, to Hudson Bay and our natural resources, my goodness, how we flourished in that regard. But I think uh, over time, our environment gets a little bit cozy. Um, we, we get that kind of three telcos, uh, five banks and a beer store mentality that it all happens here. And I, I just challenge the audience and challenge all of us to kind of take off those tethers and think in a global capacity and think about even in a midterm market mindset, how you then can be an exporter of these pockets of medium-sized companies globally. Um, our exporting capacity on a digital stage is so very relevant and very clearly available to us. Um, and, and heck, I just can't, can't wait to continue conversations that we've already started with, uh, with participants in this room, as well as beyond to see how we can partner together uh, and make these digital transformations a reality. So Michael, I'll check to the watch to say that I'm probably over time, but wanted to pass it over to you with thanks. Uh, and, and allow you to, to, to kick off the, the panel for a bit of a deeper dive discussion. Thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate it. And one of the things you'll notice with, um, with uh, this event is uh, if we've designed it right, and, and 
we seem to every year is that the conversation builds over time. So you heard Andrew reinforcing um, the amplifying effect, which echoed Eugene's hyperconnected and hyperconverged. You heard him talking about bridging the physical and virtual, and and that kind of echoes. It was a digital, digital, yeah. Um, and then the readiness that Andrew was talking about, I think, echoes just the overall structure of this event, the need to bridge both technical and process and business issues. And that's what today's panel discussion is about. If we can bring up our virtual panelists behind our physical panelists, this will be the first test of our integrated speaker, uh, speaker reality here. Jason Hood is the CTO for SHI Stratascale, the strategic division of the $12 billion US-based channel firm. Jason heads a team of CTOs at Stratascale and was formerly an IT leader in industrial companies, including a Fortune 500 automotive parts manufacturer. Hi, Jason. Hey, Michael, how you doing? Good, thanks. Thank you for joining us. Not a problem, I'm let's, excited to uh, be let's here. Let's try James Hursthaus, who is Zooming in from BC, where it's still very early. So James, thank you for that. Um, yeah. James is Chief Strategy Officer at Ampt, a provider of high performance computing and cloud solutions for video games animation and advanced enterprise applications, and is also a board member for the BC-based Digital Technology Supercluster. James, thank you for joining us this morning. Yeah, morning, Michael, and everybody there. Thanks very much for having me today. Thanks. And then in the room, just immediately to my, to my left, everybody else is right, is Joe Belinsky, VP of IT for Rivera, a leading provider of long-term accommodation and care for seniors. Um, Joe had a, a ringside seat or, or maybe uh, a center of the ring view uh, to the incredible pressure that the pandemic created for digital innovation. Joe's background also includes VPIT and CIO roles uh, with major organizations in the financial services industry. And um, at the far extreme um, is uh, San Sri Krishnan, who's a global solution architect with Equinix. Um, San has been a, a like like Joe and and um, has been a, a GCDCS fixture for many years. We were just joking about that uh, earlier this morning. It's the first time we ran across you, you helped Mary and I carry the equipment into the event. So uh, fortunately this year we have Stacy and, and her crew taking care of that. But um, we keep bringing them back because this perspective always adds to the knowledge that we share at these sessions. So let me start with an assertion here. In today's world where digital business is business, and companies are increasingly willing to accept risk in exchange for greater opportunity for innovation, senior executives see speed and agility rather than cost management as the key to delivering value. Agree or disagree and why? Jason, uh, I'd like to start with you if that's possible. Oh, yeah, that. you know, I'll, I'll agree 100% with that, Michael. I think a couple of things that I've seen in the last couple of years, you know, we used to always talk about aligning our strategy to the business strategy. And, and now I see those strategies are integrated together. And so you're starting to see where people see the value in what IT brings. They're part of the business operation. They're part of what's happening in the organization. So no longer do you just simply say, I'm going to align my strategy to the business strategy. It truly becomes that integration. And you're talking across the organization now about how you integrate and how you use those tools. And now to the point of speed. I mean, we used to call, you know, we, we used to call everybody kind of the, the, the developers that were doing things that were shadow IT, right? Now we call them citizen developers and we're getting these kinder and kinder terms as we, we bring them forward into the mainstream and we start to build out structures so they can operate in that way. So I think you're right. What you're seeing now is this complete acceptance of how do we move faster? How do we move much more quickly, be more agile and really take out some of that risk that, that uh, is inherent in that. So I agree hundred percent with that statement. So just out of curiosity, I mean, you mentioned that there's more infusion of there's greater clarity within the business with respect to the value of IT, and there's a greater infusion of IT skills through citizen developers or what Gartner is now calling business technologists within the business itself. I mean, is there a chicken and an egg in there, or is this just all evolving at the same time where the, the clarity of the of business understanding of the value of technology and the... Um, the, the rise of technologists within business units themselves is, is happening. Is, is that a, a circle or are those just parallel paths? You know, my, my belief is it's just all coming at the same time. It's not kind of a chicken and egg thing. It's really coming at the same time. You know, again, kind of going back into previous lives, you know, if I, if I think about people's career paths, 
at some point they typically dipped into IT, right? And so now you've seen all these people out into organizations that have IT experience of some way, shape or form, whether that through as an ERP implementation, whether that was through a modernization effort in an organization, but you've started to see these people who might've come out of accounting finance roles, came into IT for a project, left and went back into a role in their organization and they bring with them that knowledge of how IT works. So I don't think it's a chicken and egg thing. I think it's just kind of this evolution that's naturally happening as we start to see, you know, uh, organizations become more digitally focused. I, I love the, I love the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the term that, that we just saw was, you know, digitally first, but it was really about optimizing the business. And I think that's really where we're going. I think that's actually what we're seeing happen right now. And, and if you look at, at a guy like Eugene, who, who went through school as a, as a CPA, got into IT, but had to stay in IT to, to indulge his his growing expertise and interest in, in that field. Today, you have actually dual career paths, right? You can um, stay in the accounting department or any other department and be a technology expert, or you can, uh, you know, move over to what those people call the dark side. So it's, uh... <laughs> um, Joe, maybe I can um, bounce the same question off you. I mean, in your environment, do you find that, that you know, digital business and business have become the same thing? And do you find that executives are willing to trade off uh, risk uh, in exchange for speed and, and value speed above the cost certainty that they might have insisted on and in, in like your previous employer? <laughs> so what I would say is the pandemic has probably made this a little bit easier. Uh, before there was fear of implementing change or technology rapid change and the pandemic hit, people went remote you know, we implemented teams in, in, say, three months versus taking a year and a half to do it because it was a mandate. You had to. And so if I look at what's evolving in, in my organization, but probably in many of yours and others, is that, you know, the propensity for change and the appetite has grown. And so I would agree with the comment, but it wasn't like that before. And so another thing that happened is, you know, we democratized, and I hate that word, but all of this, right? So as an example, for the last two years, many of us work 100% remote. You know, Eugene spoke about it in, in his current roles as well. Whereas in, in 2019, people were you know struggling with with AV and no one knew what Zoom was and they thought it was you know something that you just do on the highway. So you know, as an example, you know today, you know you're on mute is now is is now you know just commonplace and we kind of laugh about it and I see some chuckling in the in the real room. But what it is, it's saying that we all now have a, a new language that we can communicate. The challenge for us is now, as I was speaking with Mary, is, is hybrid events, because remote is pretty easy. Everyone's on the same playing field. Now we're sort of mixing in a, in a joint bat. So I, I hope that kind of gives perspective. I think from a business perspective, at least in my organization, we're at the far left or right of the spectrum. We're almost 100% cloud and, and SaaS first. So my entire IT organization is really doesn't do DevOps, we do IOPS, which is a term I coined, which is really integration of cloud services. And that's our expertise. It's, it's you know, we look to the team at Equinix to run data centers and other folks to operate the infrastructure because quite frankly, that's not, I've done that before, uh, but I no longer want to do that. And my current role is running at the application layer. And I really just need to ensure that the networks work. And if anyone questioned that the internet was a reliable network, for the last two years, we ran everything on the internet, right? And if, you know, home networks were resilient, it just worked. And if there was ever an acid test or, you know, a global test for, for network connectivity, well, we've been living through it. So I absolutely agree with the comment. Sanchez is not going to let that one pass on chat. No, it, it, all the points, <laughs> all the points everybody said before. So what Jason was saying and Joe was saying are perfectly valid. But I'm going to give you guys a very different perspective. And I'm going to point to one of the largest venture capitalist funds out there. Uh, have you guys read the A16Z paper on the trillion dollar paradox of cloud? It's a fantastic read. I strongly encourage everybody to read this. And what they say is scalability is fantastic. The cloud gives you the ability to innovate, to do a lot of things really quickly. But it's not the be all end all. Physical infrastructure, actually, when it comes to point, there comes a point, an inflection point, where they recommend to all of their companies that they're investing heavily in, flip to physical infrastructure from an OPEX to a CAPEX, right? But, and to coin to pick on something Andrew said earlier, 
don't be rigid about it. Be open enough to pivot back and forth, to go to what works for your business at this point in time. That's the whole thing behind shadow IP or what they're coining now as, I uh, forgot what you were saying, Michael, earlier, the new phrase for it, citizen developer, thank you. So like, if you look at citizen developers, they are the subject matter expert. They know what they need to be successful in their job. Listen to them, but ensure that your IT, you're not even IT, your digital infrastructure, forget IT, your digital infrastructure is nimble enough to support that, right? Our view on it is three key concepts, right? Digital edge, connect to whatever the heck you want to via digital ecosystems. No, but there's a point to this, oh my God. There's a point to this. Digital ecosystems, right? And the digital core, which is where all of your key assets sit. Now to talk to, talk to Joe's point about the internet, that's what a digital ecosystem is. And the internet works perfectly in a regional connectivity model, right? No issue. But now the moment you're talking about 60 milliseconds of latency plus coast to coast, and this is a unique issue with Western Canada, we see day in, day out. You have a fundamental challenge. The internet as a delivery mechanism is a non-deterministic hack. So the variability destroys most old applications. If your application, it comes back to the application, if your application is up to date and is designed in a proper end tier manner with full distribution capabilities, now you're playing with fire, right? That's really it. It, it. And it's the wrap up of what Eugene was saying. It's about extreme connectivity, adaptive automation, and hyper cloud computing. But one piece, all at the speed of software. You need to take a software first approach. Fair enough. And thank you for that. As, and as I mentioned, these things do build on each other. So thank you for building further. And actually, you know, Mary and I put together a model years ago of what constituted sophistication in hybrid IT. And at the extreme is exactly what you were talking about. Place workloads where they function best. Don't place them within the constraints of what it is you've architected into the system. Bingo, put, them, put your workload, like I use an example, and it's gonna be a bit of tongue in cheek. If your eyeballs are in Namibia, why are you hosting something in Toronto? It makes no freaking sense, pardon the language, right? Bring it as close to your eyeballs as you can. Same conversation with Western Canada. You know, and and yeah. and uh, James can speak to this, right? Given his position in Vancouver, in Vancouver, because they're like the forgotten sister city out west, right? We Constantly, hundred milliseconds in Manitoulin, and I'm not, I'm not even remotely sympathetic to six. Yeah, but but you had the view, so you have no excuse. <laughs> we have the beach. That's true, James. As long as uh, as long as you are uh, like your ears are burning, you know, over the high latency connection. When we last spoke, you described AMPT as hosting the metaverse, which is a, a great tagline. Um, for those of us, you know, both in the room and, and in the 275 folks who are registered online, who are wondering exactly what that means, what do you mean by metaverse and, and what's involved in hosting it? Well, so it's interesting, you know, um, obviously Collins, you can debate whether or not NFT is actually a word or an acronym or an abbreviation, but you know, it's, when you look at the Collins word of the year, it was actually NFT. Uh, but also in that list were the words metaverse and crypto and a whole bunch of other things that have come like, you know, uh, hyper commuting and all those sorts of things. Uh, so for us, you know, metaverse has been around for probably 15, 16 years at this point, even though the term itself's obviously getting its day in the sun right now. Uh, I was actually uh, even though I wear multiple hats now, you know, my, my main part of my career has been as a video games guy. And way back in 2007, you know, I contributed to this white paper called the Metaverse Roadmap. Uh, and even back then, I think, you know, it was clear that the video games industry sort of viewed itself as being pioneers of quite a lot of what's coming to fruition right now. And there's been a sort of phrase in the space uh, about how video games write the first draft of history. And so, you know, I think the rest of the world is kind of catching up to that, right? So it's things like game engine technology, but also, you know, things like game platform, uh, currencies. Uh, and you can see, for example, the, the emergence of crypto out of, of early stage, you know, virtual soft currencies in spatial worlds like Second Life and World of Warcraft and all those sorts of, sorts of things. And so I think right now, when you look at Metaverse, um, really why there's so much attention to it right now is that this this sort of combination of technologies that's really unlocked what people are describing as the next chapter or actually the next iteration of the of the entire internet um, is really coming to fruition you know in 2021 2022 so there's a very active uh, venture capitalist in the space called matthew ball and if anybody's interested in taking a deeper dive into metaverse i really do recommend 
matthewball.vc as a, as a great resource. But, you know, Matthew says that the metaverse serves as a functional successor to the web, uh, but only this time because it's fully 3D and because it's fully immersive and it's kind of like a single space, you know, how, how much of that's actually uh, generated as a 3D immersive world sort of remains to be seen. Uh, but yeah, so basically a functional successor to the current web, uh, only this time with even greater reach, time spent and commercial activity, generating even greater economic upside than the entire current internet, which is obviously why, you know, so many companies, large and small, and so much uh, investment activity is currently happening into the space. Uh, and people would say that actually the metaverse in its full version and when it's fully manifested is the gateway to pretty much every digital experience. Um, and a key component of all physical ones. And I think, you know, a lot of the other speakers have been talking about the requirement for edge-based compute. And that I think is primarily for driving things like augmented reality, you know, spectacles or these types of things. So it's not just an entirely virtual space. It's definitely the blending of the virtual space with the real world as well. Um, and then actually people would describe it as the next great labor platform. So if you see what's going on with things like crypto, NFT, and, and recently there's been a trend to what's being called play to earn video games where people are actually sort of playing video games based on blockchain and actually able to earn an increased va real value real world value there you know my opinion is that's a sort of precursor to what matthew is describing as the digital labor platform of the future in the same way that some of the virtual currencies that we had sort of in the early to mid 2000s were a precursor to what we see now going on in blockchain and crypto so i mean to answer the question simply it's the next generation of the internet. And, you know, we often think about if you could go back to 1995 at the dawn of the current internet, what would you do? I think everybody sort of within the industry feels that that's the opportunity that we have uh, right ahead of us. Thanks. Anybody, uh, anybody want to uh, ask any further questions on that before we, uh, before we move on or? I mean, it's just one quick additional uh, point there. You know, there's a lot of research that shows a uh, PwC report recently that shows the impact of mixed reality technologies um, on the GDPs of, of particularly developed nations, right? And so some of those statistics will say that the impact of mixed reality technologies and these things, which I think have this convenient label of metaverse, will actually sort of increase, for example, the U.S., uh, GDP by 2030 by almost threefold, right? And so the impact across not only entertainment, but all these other sectors is is pretty, you know, impressive. And I, and again, that's why I think there's just so much interest that suddenly, well, I say suddenly, you know, it's a 16 year overnight sort of success, but uh, nonetheless, that's why I think there's so much attention on the space right now. Thanks, it, it, it does get worse. We've got a, a quantum guy on the next panel. So, uh, you know, there's uh, <laughs> but it's you know that's that's really interesting and hopefully you know Andrew's earlier note that uh, he's trying to ensure that Canada is not a cottagey outpost and the digital economy will uh, will play out as we get to play to earn or learning a living or well, and also what Andrew mentioned about for example GDPR and you know as we get this interoperable single space how does that make sense as different countries are starting to introduce more onerous uh, data protection uh, legislation. And, uh, you know, I just to sort of echo uh, what Andrew was saying, I think, you know, Canada has an opportunity at, with a progressive and sensible, you know, data storage uh, legislation where we can actually, for example, become quite central in, in things like data storage and, uh, and protection as we start to look at an interoperable sort of fully seamless digital world. Those, those challenges are definitely going to come up, right? Thanks. Um, since, you know, I, See you with the with the microphone poised to go there. I mean, we've heard now that speed and agility are paramount to digital uh, the digital business world, going all the way from automating core processes to uh, introducing new systems and the and the parallel worlds of the metaverse. What's involved in making this a reality for businesses that are looking to innovate at scale? Not being rigid. Not being rigid. That's the key thing. So going back to what James said just now. Um, think of the meta, the metaverse is interesting and I love that concept, right? I love it, but I'm going to distill it down to its most common element. It's a video game. And if you think about the use case, right? And I, I don't mean that in a bad way. Video games were what I'm a reformed gamer. I mean, reformed gamer, because I just don't have time to video game anymore as much as I'd love to, but 
what the thing I love about video games is the ability to escape from the four walls of your living room into something completely fictional in your head. The metaverse gives us that on a global scale with reality mixed into it. And that's a crazy thing. It's so hard to explain. With that comes democratization of data, democratization of services. It's now all about how do you deliver service to who needs it, when they need it in real time. And I'm going to draw a, a corollary to this whole conversation back to the start of the pandemic, right? The number of conversations I had with entities similar to the challenges Joe was facing with teams saying, hey, I've got 120,000 people that need to work from home, but I've got less than 5% remote working capabilities at any right. given point in time. How 6, do we thousand VPN licenses? And <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, right. How do I do it? Help me help myself. And, and there were that, two that concept of citizen developer, sorry, just to, yeah. somebody mentioned citizen developer early. I think that's key because we aren't, you know, Facebook announced it's hiring 10,000 people in Europe and spending mm -hmm. billions of dollars. But in order to create this next iteration of the world, we need citizen developers. And I think that's an excellent term when it comes to sort of one of the key components that we need to unlock to see this future really become a reality, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right, James. And it goes to the whole concept of W3, right? Or WWW3 or however you want yeah, to refer to it, Web3.0, web whatever, yeah. whatever it is, whatever the latest catchphrase is for the description of it, right? It's all about democratizing delivery of services. But to the point I was trying to make with regards to the start of the pandemic, organizations that were rigid, right? You know, take, take some of the big five here, right? Big five banks that were rigid, had challenges. It took them months upon a months upon months just to get their day-to-day -day staff back to working during a nine to five. No, no, they're back now, but they're, no, no, not in the office. When I say back to working, I mean being on corporate assets from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. when they should be working. There were emails sent out that said, hey, stay off corporate assets between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. because we need the bandwidth for customer facing application. That was an actual note that was sent out by, by somebody to, to their organization. And that speaks volumes. When you're in a rigid and fixed environment where you can't be nimble, you have a problem, you have a challenge. Organizations that took the approach of software defined, took the approach of, hey, let me distribute my architecture. Let me get away from this. And to Joe's point earlier, away from the big honking centralized data centers that I own and I want to hug and I want to keep near me to a distributed approach to say, hey, if I've got eyeballs in, you know, I'm going to make something up here. Winnipeg, let me put that, what they need to access closer to them in Winnipeg, right? Or if they're in Denver, let me put that closer to them in Denver and it goes far as Singapore, whatever, sure. right? Move that data, set up those edges. That gave them the ability to respond in real world. And what we did to help these organizations we use the power of the cloud to scale, okay. very simply. So, so thank you. Um, and I just looked up while you were talking, how many employees does RBC have? And it came back uh, 83,000 <laughs> and, for the, and, and for, for the record, uh, can't say who the customer was, but it wasn't them. Okay, but still, if you get that many employees, it would be painful to say, but don't worry. Um, Joe, listen, um, we've heard about the rapid sprawl of facilities and data and points of presence and applications. Um, what do you and your staff do to connect the dots across these various platforms? Um, that's a good question, Michael. Um, I think there's really two things. So when, when we look at, like, as I mentioned before, our team is a little bit more in these in the scope of being application specialists on behalf of the business as opposed to kind of core infrastructure engineers or whatnot we do have some of that capability um so we're really it, it kind of pulls together the conversation that everyone's been leading is that um in our organization there isn't a business decision that hasn't have a technology component so while i don't i, I love the citizen developer term it has good and bad connotations i think the if i take away the negative the the positive side is that people are technically savvy or are able to use data in a meaningful way as opposed to shadow it which is kind of the negative connotation so we'll, we'll kind of focus on the positive um you know we a, a common question is you know during the height of the pandemic we need to see need to effectively manage outbreaks in our homes and respond quickly so we have to pull data from a variety of systems. So it's the 
technology organization that's pulling that together. And now that's becoming a core, I'll call it data capability for integration. Kind of goes back to my other comment where I said to you is that we're integration specialists versus developers of, or DevOps specialists. Um, the second part is really, and I, and I kind of go back to the pandemic and the conversation we had is we're kind of shifting away for what I would say is legacy or core IT capability. It's still something we deliver, but it's not the focus. And the example I would give is making all kind of end user experiences or edge experiences for corporate IT self-serve, right? Everything, right? And it starts with, you know, Teams is the go-to, whether you're in office or at home, your platform, you know, is open. We're cloud first. We use multi-factor authentication. You can bring your own devices. The office is hotel space, you know, hotel set up, and we provide minimal IT support for that um, because that's not what the business needs and that's not what they pay us for, right? They need that. But when they say, what's the value proposition you bring to the organization? While they look to those things, they just expect that to happen, and it's a big challenge. Um, but I think the pandemic has allowed us to pivot. That's kind of the second. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Jason, listen, you're, we've talked about the metaverse. We've talked about the distribution of, of, of capabilities and applications and data to the edge. Um, the notion that all business decisions have a technology component, um, a shift from legacy core tightly managed to edge slash self-service. Um, you've, you are a CTO with an industrial background. You manage a staff of CTOs that deal daily with requirements across many different sectors. How much of what we're talking about is real? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think a ton of that and, you know, a couple of good points that, that were mentioned earlier. You know, I, I think as, as we look at the citizen development side of that and as it grows, you know, there, there's IT shifts from really being the provider of everything to the kind of guideposts and the organization that, can provide rails that allow people to move quickly in that space. You know, it was mentioned earlier as well about companies moving maybe away from the cloud and moving back to more of an on-premise, you know, but, but think of the cloud, not as a location, but think of the cloud as a construct of tools. And that's how I like to look at the cloud is it's really a construct of tools that allow you to be agile and quick and successful in what you do. Um, and so that location becomes a little bit less meaningful it really is, you know, where is it going to be in an Equinix data center? Is it going to be in my own data center? Is it going to be in an AWS public cloud? But that cloud really is a construct of tools that allow you to be very quick. So, you know, more and more, I start to see where, where IT isn't necessarily the, the, you know, the builder. IT is more mm -hmm. that integrator and that kind of guardrails. And you start to see even now when I talk to CISOs in organizations, you know, CISOs used to be just lock everything down. They used to be very difficult to work with. And now the CISO role has kind of changed into this, you know, make sure we're enabled, make sure that we can start to use the tools that we have to secure the organization, but make it easy to do business with us. And so there's this, this business impact that's happening in there as well. That's, a, that's really interesting. Um, let me ask you as, you, as you move down this path, you know, where IT shifts from source and builder to guide and integrator and the the CISO shifts from someone who locks things down to somebody who enables things to happen. Are there any gotchas that the folks who are attending this session, either in the room or, or virtually, need to watch out for as they move towards a, a faster and more digital future? Yeah, I mean, you know, if I think about a couple of enablers and that first is, is just, it sounds simple, but keeping things as close to update as you can. Doesn't mean you have to be most current, right? But but holding on to some of that really old technology provides drag behind that, it becomes difficult to manage and it's difficult to integrate, difficult to access data from. With data being king now, getting data out of systems becomes one of the really, really important pieces. And we saw that with the pandemic, Joe kind of mentioned that as well. Um, so, you, you know, I think that's number one, I would say, you know, the, the other thing that they can really focus on is understanding the business and the business needs. Um, you know, I touched on early on the, the ability to, you know, integrate your strategy. If you don't understand the business and what they want, and you're really just focused on the technology, you know, that's, it's going to be a very tough road for you. Thanks. That's, um, that's good guidance actually on both, both those, especially, you know, managing tech debt and staying focused on uh, data accessibility, but also of course being integrated as, you know, Joe said, there's no uh, business decision without a technology component, but in, insisting that the flip side of that is true as well, that there are no technology decisions that aren't rooted in, in, in business uh, uh, decisions is, is, I think, really good guidance. Um, 
James, I got to say, you know, once the metaverse starts rattling around in one's head, it kind of carves out its own space. And my boss is sitting back there and probably grinning a little bit. He asked for uh, predictions for next year. And after talking to you last time, I decided to write one on metaverse rather than cybersecurity, which is my actual job. But I, I actually thought your thing was cooler. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of envisioning a world where each of us is as we define ourselves, you know, rather than in the space and skin we, we currently inhabit. Is this how the metaverse rolls out? And, and what does that mean to businesses or governments or hospitals or, or any other kind of organization that's looking to align its digital presence with these and its physical presence with these super evolved customer expectations? Yeah, it, that's a really great point. I mean, I think uh, Sanj said it really well earlier on when he sort of described, you know, at its core that the metaverse is like a video game. Uh, and it's interesting to unpack that for a second because, you know, that's a really good basis for thinking about the sorts of expectations that, you know, you might describe a gamer generation. You know, the average age of, of gamers these days, according to the Entertainment Software Association, is 34. Right. So it's no longer, you know, just the domain of kids. It's 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 people like me and my kids and we sort of play video games together. So that creates a whole ton of expectations around, you know, graphic fidelity or, you know, what it's like to be in a 3D spatial environment. And obviously we're already seeing 3D spatial environments being applied to, you know, medical research and architecture, construction, commerce, you know, the, the sort of dawn of the 3D shopping mall, online 3D shopping mall is right there. And obviously that comes along with a ton of opportunities and challenges, right? Imagine putting on your augmented reality glasses and having your pupil dilation tracked, for example, right? We're no longer clicking to express interest. The interest in something is, is undeniable, right? Um, so I think you're right that it is about consumers having this choice of, of how they express themselves and interact in this space. You know, one of the other top 10 Collins words of the year was actually neo-pronoun. And I think we see people in general wanting to take the opportunity to, to sort of become who they are and express themselves in those ways. Um, so yeah, and the other thing is it's not just virtual reality anymore, right? So we talk about 3D spatial worlds and obviously a lot of that has come from, from video games, but the overlay of the augmented reality layer on top of everything is again, I think gonna increase these expectations for engagement. So a couple of those, I think the key pieces that are coming in again, it is all about the high performance edge, you know, and that's why, you know, Amps sort of strategy of trying to blend the convenience of cloud with the performance of high performance compute architectures and then things like you know the the equinix fabric and and the interconnectivity there as we create this seamless environment is it's just so important in terms of consumer response right so john carmack uh you know formerly oculus and obviously um you know now working you know been in v vr for a long time long long time he says that you know in order to prevent people from really starting to get that motion sickness or the that sense of latency you need sub 20 millisecond connectivity right and so the challenge ahead of us from a technology perspective is how do we provide this environment um you know and and have it all working at sub 20 milliseconds in order to create an experience for consumers that will unlock you know this additional value you know or, or more value than the current internet um as we started to talk about at the beginning you know we could probably go on with this conversation for hours because it's fascinating but i am i did just get the five minute uh motion from from mary so sanja i'd like to tie the session together by asking you to connect the two items in the session title digital transformation and innovation how do you describe the critical links between infrastructure modernization and avoiding some of the some of the tech debt that Jason talked about and innovation and some of the stuff that, that James is talking about? What needs to be built into the foundation to allow businesses to flourish? That's a great question. So I'm going to sum it up in, in one phrase, everything we've talked about. User experience. That's what it comes down to. Gone are the days. And I mean, Joe, all, everybody in the panel, you guys will know what I'm talking about, right? Remember the good old days when you used to go out and I want this fancy switch and I want these servers and I'm going to build this and, hey, business, bring me your application. Those were the good old days, right? Where you could tinker with pure technology. Done. Gone. It's a, well, they, they were fun. I mean, remember, remember, remember playing with demo gear? Like I'm a gearhead. Remember playing with demo gear and like, oh my God, I've got a 10 gig port. Okay, what do I do with this thing? What do I actually do with this thing, right? Yeah, it, good old days. I'm tongue in cheek. But this day and age, it's really all about this, if you guys can see me, right? This drives everything, right? The majority of the work I've done over the last year, believe it or not, has been on this, right? 
And what's so crazy about it is it's all about the user experience, about getting the information you need, the service you need, when you need it, regardless of the medium. So the metaverse is generally, if we bubble it even further down from the video game example, it's getting what you need when you need it. Whether that's through augmented reality on your phone, whether that's through um, you know, VR glasses that are scanning your eyeballs, whether that's through uh, something as sim simple, I'm being tongue in cheek again, as the Disney band, if any of you guys have been to Disney in the last five years, right? It's all about user experience and identifying what your wants and needs are and catering to those. That's what the metaverse enables. But here's the flip side to all of that. All of that requires massive amount of data modeling, data gathering, data analytics, whether it's on the devices like this, whether it's at edge compute, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's on, and I'm going to pick on Rivera for a second, whether it's on core legacy enterprise systems in a data center because of regulatory requirements, right? You need he that. He doesn't have any of that. He, he, he could. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's in theory, yes, that's where we are. But every organization, here's the scary thing. Every single organization, no matter if you're born in the cloud, has tech debt. It's how do you retire it? And it comes down to being nimble and being nimble with your architecture. Set it up in a way that allows you to grow and flex and expand and contract and deploy and shift as you need to. Respond, not react. I Respond, believe, exactly. I've heard you use. Respond, <laughs> not react. And there's a flip side to all of this also. We're talking about the cheery, fun side of everything, right? How do we enable um, business? How do we enable all the good stuff? But there's a bad stuff too with all of this. What happens when you have a data breach? How do you respond to that, right? That is a different conversation and we are at one minute, but thank yep. you for that because as lead cybersecurity research analyst, that it matters to me. We, uh, we actually have- Man, uh, lead, lead cybersecurity. I thought you just changed your title to like lead metaverse analyst. <laughs> well, we need a lot of security in the metaverse, that that's for sure. Find is digital experience. My colleague, um, uh, Keith, who's, who's actually been blowing up my phone with Texas, is responsible for digital experience within the company. And now that we've said that we all work for him, he's, he's, He's uh, certainly excited by the fact that it all comes down to user experience. So thank you, Sans, for making Keith's day and, and all the rest of us. Thank you to everybody on the panel. This has been terrific. We really appreciate it.